Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Edward. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, as Edward mentioned, I'm uh, working at Cedar um, on this uh, Marie Curie Enterprise Ireland Career Fit Fellowship. Um, so my interest is in natural language processing and text analysis as applied to data from social science and humanities. So that means things like historical texts, political texts, social media text, and legal text. And as my part of my project in Cedar, I work with a company called Corelytics, um, who work on analyzing uh, financial regulations and, and regulatory documents. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you uh, about natural language processing in general, and then uh, look at some examples uh, taken from social media text, and some ways of kind of quickly uh, developing prototypes and dashboards for analyzing uh, texts like that. Okay, so I've kind of just said that there. The, the package I'm going to talk about at the end to do visualization is a, a, a component of the R programming language called Shiny, which allows you to develop um, very quickly dashboards and interfaces that include sliders, radio buttons, drop-down boxes, text areas, hook in the machine learning components to them um, without writing any JavaScript. So um, I'm sure a lot of people here work in Python. Python is excellent for natural language processing. In the social sciences, uh, R is very widely used, um, so people might not know, uh, you know JavaScript or, or Python. Um, but now there are really good tools in the R programming language for, for, for doing this. So if you know R but don't know Python, it's uh, not as necessary as it once was to, to switch. Um, if you put NLP into Google, the first results you get are often about neuro-linguistic programming, which is a kind of business psychology concept. It's nothing to do with the academic uh, area that I'm talking about here. So this is natural language processing. Uh, so that's the automated or computational processing of natural language. And the slight distinction, you know, natural language as in uh, English or, or other, other human languages, like the language I'm speaking now, so it's the analysis of that and not um, things like uh, computer languages or other types of information encoded in text. Like there's a lot of work on doing analysis of uh, genetic data in text form. So it is text analysis, but it's not natural language processing. So that's the distinction there. Um, and there are lots and lots and lots of applications for this. A huge pipeline, uh, you know, going from when you first speak into, speak into a system such as your phone, uh, down to the, the responses and the interaction you get with that. So uh, voice recognition, automatic translation, parsing, uh, recognizing entities. These are all, uh, you know, really, really dense research areas on their own. If you look for it, in uh, Google Scholar for any one of these areas, there's hundreds of new papers uh, every year. Um, so I'll show you some quick examples of those, and then I'm going to focus a little bit in on uh, classification. Uh, in particular, and then exploring word meanings, a new area called uh, distributional semantics. And just those packages I mentioned before, if you work in R, uh, two text packages commonly used are Quantita and TidyText, and in Python, um, NLTK used to be very widely used. It's kind of been, I think, taken over uh, from a little bit by these other two packages, Spacey and the Stanford Core NLP Toolkit. So the Stanford Toolkit is actually a Java toolkit, but it has Python bindings too. So this is an example of the output from uh, Spacey's uh, syntactic parsers. This is an automated parse of a sentence. If you read down from the top there on the, on the left, uh, the sentence is, we are building a better health service and providing more care. Um, and then you can see in this table all of the structured information that a modern NLP system is able to extract. So the second column there, the lemma, is a process sometimes very similar to a process like stemming, where the inflected form of the word, like providing or building, is reduced to its uh, root form, goes morpheme or its lemma, so build or provide. Um, so stemming just cuts the end, cuts the inflection of the words, basically. Lemmatization is a little bit more clever. You can see the second line there, it converts the verb are to its root form be. So whether it's are or was or is, it gets converted to the root um, be. And then the final three columns encode the syntactic information about the sentence. So you've got the part of speech of the word detected. And then the last two is easier to understand if you see it as a, as a tree. But basically, for each word, it tells you uh, the type of syntactic relation it's in with another word in the sentence. So uh, we is the noun subject of the verb build. Um, and that's really useful for extracting uh, Propositions, you know, you know, predicates, logical expressions from texts when they can be uh, they can be actually uh, realized in surface language in many many different ways. 
Um, okay, so uh, you're probably fairly familiar with the idea of classification, even as it's been uh, as it is applied to to documents or texts. So email spam detection is a type of classification. We want to say whether uh, a document in your inbox is spam or not spam. We might want to do a kind of uh, hierarchical classification by placing a document into ta taxonomy. So, for example, if we want to say that a, um, an, a comment on a social media website is uh, spam, or it might be uh, uh, unwanted in a different way, like being too toxic or, or, or abusive. Uh, so, so this is just kind of the same problem as, as classification, but in a hierarchical way. Um, and these, this task can also be a continuous task, so there's very little difference in practice in the way you implement this. You can, uh, uh, your output function can be something that converts a toxicity score into a, a binary yes-no decision for uh, spam or not spam, abusive or not abusive. Um, sentiment, you've probably heard of, means like a positive or a negative uh, emotional content in a comment or a review of a product or something. So whatever the specific outcome in terms of classification or uh, placing on a scale, um, the, the method is, is fairly similar. We, we're looking to extract information from the text, like words, phrases, syntactic relations, and use these as features uh, in a model to, to get an output. And then there's an unsupervised version of this where we can just extract features from the text, again, like word frequencies, phrases like bigrams or trigrams or syntactic properties, and without any particular classes in mind, simply scale the documents on a, on a map, a 2D or a 3D map, and see which documents naturally are, are similar or close to one another. And this, in, in the supervised classification case, this uh, has all of the usual um, evaluation metrics of a, of a classification task. So you have to consider, uh, as always, your business case here. If you're a social media company, um, it's not just the accuracy of your kind of abusiveness detector you need to worry about. You need to worry about which, is, which kind of error is worse for your business. Is it worse to um, you know, delete a comment that, that actually wasn't abusive, or is it worse to allow through a comment that uh, was abusive? So they can both have uh, uh, you know, bad consequences. Um, so accuracy alone is not always the best score. OK, so any of you familiar with uh, NLP in the last few years might have heard of topic modeling. So topic modeling is a way of discovering uh, topics or, or issues uh, from a group of texts uh, in an unsupervised way without having pre-specified uh, classes in mind. So topic modeling exploits the way that words are distributed differently across different documents to extract uh, groups or, or clusters of words that represent particular topics. So this kind of these rows of words here are uh, output from a model trained on British newspapers. Each row uh, corresponds to a particular topic, and you can see that there are some topics that seem to correspond to healthcare, others that correspond to the media, others to court and the police. Um, and this isn't uh, you know nobody puts this information into the model. You tell it how many topics you want, and uh, these kind of related groups of words emerge from the way that words vary across documents. There's good packages for doing these in, uh, in Python and, and R off the shelf. OK, and then um, an area that I'm personally interested in is uh, uh, one that's got uh, maybe a bit more attention in recent years, uh, which is uh, distributional semantics, or um, trying to learn about the meanings of words, the semantics of words, uh, based on statistics of how they occur in text. So this has got a lot of attention recently because of uh, progress uh, with word embeddings and word to vec. But it's not a not a new idea as such. There's a, a history in linguistics and the philosophy of language that says, uh, you know, words don't have some kind of um, completely objective uh, meaning handed down from the sky. The, the meaning of a word comes from how it's used in society, used in, in ordinary language, and we can model uh, what a word means in a particular linguistic community by looking at how uh, speakers uh, use the word. And the, the way the word is used is the definition of, how it's, uh, of what its meaning is. Um, so, as I said, this is not a new idea. In, in uh, these references I have at the bottom of the slide there, uh, I'm going, there are these, some of these predate word embeddings, but there was even older techniques in the 80s and 90s called uh, latent semantic analysis, uh, latent semantic indexing. It's just that the availability of very, very large text corpora and much more processing power has kind of uh, made these um, 
methods more successful and more accessible. You know, um, depending on what you count as, uh, as a word, the English language, most people have about 50,000 words in their, in their vocabulary. The wide range of, around that, as I said, depends on what you, what you call a word. Um, but if you think that you want to look at the occurrence of each word in the vocabulary with every other word in the vocabulary, you're already starting to fill up a matrix uh, that's 50,000 by 50,000, and you need a lot of text to get examples of, before you run across examples of many co-occurrences. So, until recently, there were sort of uh, data and computational issues. But now, um, now everyone's using uh, word vectors and word embeddings, which are like the previous techniques. They just use a different method, either a neural network or SVD, to reduce the space of the, uh, the word co-occurrence matrix. Um, and you might be thinking of everything I've said so far, I haven't mentioned uh, deep learning, so where does it fit in in the context of all these things? Well, word vectors, word embeddings are not a deep learning technique. They do use a shallow neural network um, to, to reduce the dimensionality of the co-occurrence matrix. Uh, but um, where deep learning really is applied a lot these days is in the previous tasks I showed you, like uh, translation, speech recognition, dialogue systems. A lot of these things now are the best performing systems, are systems that just take in very, very low-level features, like words or even characters, and you have a deep learning system that goes completely end-to-end -to, -end to do uh, translation or question answering or something like that. But for the applications I'm interested in, like um, uh, social science, law, humanities, uh, interpretability is very important, and people in, uh, in these areas are used to using uh, interpretable regressions. And while there are definitely uh, there is progress being made on interpreting deep learning models. Uh, it's still not as straightforward as you know, looking at the, the, uh, uh, the value of a parameter in a, in a regression or a, some kind of linear or near linear method. So if the, and often in these cases, the, the, a regression or a naive Bayes or something like that, a linear SVM on a, a bag of words or a bag of trigrams gives very, very close to as good performance as the deep learning method. So it's at least worth trying the the uh, kind of more traditional statistical learning approach before going to deep learning. Um, so yeah, this is an example of, I'm going to show you now an example of uh, one application of distributional semantics, which is to uh, look at what, how word meanings changed over time and what meanings of particular words were in the past. This is a tool that's uh, been developed years ago uh, in the UK called the Sketch Engine. And the idea is to, to from a corpus, uh, produce a sketch of what a word means. So this is from a uh, corpus in the 18th century, which is why you have these funny long S's in some of the spellings. And the idea is to just get an overall uh, idea for what the word liberty meant in this time period by looking at how it occurred in syntactic relations with other words. So liberty and property, liberty and privilege, liberty and rights. These were common associations in the time. And then other types of uh, uh, syntactic relationships like the preposition friend of liberty, cause of liberty, blessings of liberty. And you can use slightly different association scores other than just word frequency uh, to control for the background frequency of words and in different ways play around with the word association scores to see what th the corpus suggests the word, the word means. So that tool is called the Sketch Engine, if you'd like to look it up online. Um, OK, so I'm going to show you an example and uh, hopefully a demo of uh, working with some modern um, political text. Uh, from social media, uh, from Reddit. So uh, Reddit is a very good source of text data. It has a lot of um, problems too. So there's a lot of kind of really terrible content on Reddit, terrible communities, a lot of abusive uh, uh, content. And it is, uh, you know, it's not a random sample of the population. 70% of Reddit users are men and it's demographically skewed, uh, skewed younger as well. Um, but a really nice property of the text from Reddit is that it's very neatly divided into subsections. So you have um, lots and lots of specific communities. There's a community for Manchester United, a community for vacuum cleaners, and a community for every political, uh, political affiliation you can think of. And these are good test grounds for political text because uh, the rules of the, you can, you can see the, the rules for each subreddit and they clearly say what's allowed. And these places tend to suggest that they're places where people who who consider themselves to be socialists, for example, come to talk about socialism among themselves. So it's not really an argument that involves lots of different things mixed together. They're kind of clean examples of, of people who, with this ideology uh, using the language. 
Um, and then I also have a demo. I don't have enough time to show you both, but I'll put the URLs up for both of them. Uh, there's a corpus in one of the one of the R packages. Has it comes with a corpus of uh, speeches from U.S. Uh, presidential primary debates for the Republican Party. Um, so there's, you know, this kind of data, at least in the modern context, there's a lot of it out there. Uh, yeah, this is an example of uh, some of the discussion from the Reddit uh, socialism uh, community, just to show you that, you know, this is an anonymous online community talking about politics. So, you know, you might expect it's going to be pretty terrible, um, but it's, a lot of them are fairly well moderated, and the text often does, you know, uh, contain uh, good political discussion, at least as close as you get, you know, um, access to online among ordinary people talking about politics. It's not all uh, terrible and abusive. And there's a lot of metadata with it, so you can get the co content of the comments, and you can get their score and their, their time of creation, so you can kind of filter the data in, in different ways. So uh, what I did with this data uh, was to extract co-occurrence relations uh, from the words by looking at how often one word co-occurred in the same comment as another word. Uh, and then you can use the co-occurrence frequencies to build a score. Uh, you can do that by uh, just using the frequency score, but if you do that, it tends to be that the words with the highest score are simply the words that are most generally frequent in language. If you know the, uh, the measure of mutual information, pointwise mutual information, something like that is a way to control for the background frequency of the word. Um, and then extract for every pair of words, you'll have a score for in the corpus overall, how often do they tend to co-occur co together. And you can use that uh, score between each pair of words to build a network. So if the score is above a certain threshold, then we'll draw an edge between the two words. Um, and then you've got a, a, a semantic network or a word co-occurrence network. And you can do, use all the tools of network science on that. So this is an example of the, uh, a, a list of the terms with the highest centrality in the networks extracted from the libertarian and socialism uh, communities using two different network centrality measures. And you can see that, they, at least for face validity, it really clearly reflects the most important terms uh, that you would think would be most important to those uh, communities. Now, you might get something like this out of topic modeling, uh, but it's a different approach, and it uh, also allows uh, for kind of flexible exploration, as I said, with all the tools of, of network science. Okay, and then you can also build a, 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 an R da a, a dashboard in R with all the packages that R provides to explore this. I'm going to hopefully show you a demo of this now. So... So, um, as I said at the start of the talk, Shiny is a, uh, an R package that allows you to build dashboards uh, with panels, uh, input boxes, sliders, uh, for exploring data quickly. Now, if you've got you know, a, a huge uh, uh, customer-facing product, you, you, know, you probably have designers to, to do this kind of thing in JavaScript and Python for you. But for an academic researcher or for someone prototyping internal tools, being able to develop these kind of interfaces uh, quickly uh, without having to use JavaScript is, is really great. And also, there's a lot of uh, really cool uh, uh, visualization packages in R. So the network visualization and the, um, all the different data viz uh, packages R provides, I think, is richer than what, than what Python does. Um, and it's also really responsive. So the, uh, the, the data visualization components are hooked into the input components and will respond to, to new input really quickly. So you, know, you can immediately uh, uh, enter in new terms and see how the network spreads out. And there's uh, 2D and 3D uh, visualization packages. And you can use the things that, um, you know, that iGraph offer you. So if you have things like shortest path, uh, will detect the shortest path between the two nodes and make that into a network. So you can, uh, and this is all adjustable. Maybe the, uh, the labels are a little bit large there, but you can uh, adjust all that stuff with, with iGraph. Um, and then there's also a, a classification example, if it loads. Um, so this is the data from the, uh, from the Republican primary debates. So the Quantita package comes with uh, these speeches preloaded. So I don't know if you can see. Um, uh, I trained uh, uh, two uh, regression models on this text. Um, uh, so just to say a bit about how this task works, if you're, you're trying to train uh, 
uh, a model to predict the political party and the speaker uh, based on the words in the speeches. Okay, so as I said, uh, the vocabulary might have 50,000 words. So then if you include two word phrases, bigrams in this, quickly you've got a huge, huge number of dimensions. Uh, but it's not hard to find ways to reduce these dimensions. You can exclude the most common words, uh, stock words, and you can exclude words that occur less than a certain amount of times in the text overall. Um, and then, um, depending on how many observations, how many documents you have, uh, you can do an ordinary linear regression even, or you can do a penalized regression like uh, Ridge or Lasso, which will uh, do some feature selection for you and, and discard the features that aren't needed. Um, so again, this is, these are type of models that are really responsive. The reason it starts off with the Republican uh, prediction higher is just because there's more Republican text in the corpus, so the kind of the uh, prior or the, the intercept is higher uh, for Republican. But if you start to type in text here, um, this will change live as you type. Okay, so I typed in, we need to help the poorest people in society, and it kind of balanced up a little bit more. Uh, I think Clinton's bar came up a bit. So this is really simple to do. Uh, this is the code for, for this classifier. Uh, so this is the UI code. It's, you know, literally 10 lines of code to, that reads uh, two, two bar plot outputs, and then the, the equivalent of the back end, although they all sit in the same place on the server, uh, is uh, you know less than less than 30 lines of codes to to split the input text into words and then pass that to the predict uh, method of, of the trained uh, model um, and even uh, if your data overall is less than a certain size uh, you can host your app for free uh, the site is called shinyapps.io I think it's linked to uh, our studio I saw they just stand out there. Um, and there's a button in our studio where you can click publish and it will immediately send this to a URL uh, that you can, you can try right away. So it's a, it's a great system. Um, okay, so I'll leave you uh, just with those links. And I think uh, that's it. Thank you.